webinar uh, with Philip Kramlich tonight. Uh, it's a, a webinar in the series uh, put together by uh, Scientists for Future. Uh, we call these the Future Scientists webinar series. Uh, in this series, we explore how we go forward in this decisive decade. So as scholars and scientists, we have a role in contributing- uh, In this series, we explore how we go forward Sorry, I could hear myself there. We explore how we go forward. Why? why Might have been me, myself? sorry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so as scholars and scientists, we have an important role um, in this, um, yeah, in the energy transition that we find ourselves in now. Um, so we need to stay below 1.5 degrees warming. So what system or cultural changes do we need to discuss? And how do we communicate this best? And uh, how can we take a more introspective view? How do we cope with emotions as well, coming from the uh, the bad news that's hitting us every day? So, uh, but today we will be talking about Piet and the success that uh, Turfrei.nl had uh, this year or past year in uh, getting Piet extraction on the agenda in the Netherlands. Uh, so Philip Gramlich is a science communicator and with his NGO turfrei.nl or peatfree.com, he is actively involved in reducing the use of uh, as a growing substrate in the Netherlands. This was not at all a topic here when he first came to live in the Netherlands two and a half years ago. Um, and Philip will talk about how he successfully brought this issue to public, polit polit public and political attention, as well as within the industry. So my name is Marianne Smulders, and I'm a researcher in the microbiology department at Radboud University. And I first met Philip when he contacted Scientists for Future about two years ago. And we were just at that time also thinking about that peat was a topic we should start campaigning on in the Netherlands. And so I was really happy that um, Philip and his wife Karin um, started turfvrij.nl or peatfree.com. And in fact, we've just left it to them and they, um, They've sorted it all out and we now have a confidence. Uh, so I'm really happy with the work that Philip and his wife Karen have done. And I think there are also lessons to be learned uh, for how we can start actions and follow through. So welcome, Philip. I'll pass the floor to you now. And I'm really looking forward to this webinar. All right, thank you very much. And thank you everybody for being here today. Um, I hope that there's also plenty of people in uh, YouTube for those who are on YouTube, feel free to join us. Um, there is a link in the YouTube description as far as I've been informed. So you can just hop onto the Zoom if you wish. You can, of course, also, um, it's nice that there are a few people with the camera on, but of course you can also join with the camera off if you prefer that. Um, Mary and me are spotlighted, so you won't be on the recording as far as I know. Right. Now, science communication is part of what we talk about today. And one of the ground rules of science communication is that you shouldn't start negative. Um, and therefore, I decided to start shocking. Now, um, you don't want to have any scientists sitting on the table. It's something I've heard uh, in the process of the Commandant discussions. What was the context of that? Um, we are two people, uh, the only NGO sitting on the table for the Dutch Peak Covenant. And yeah, we're greatly outnumbered uh, by 20 people, mostly from the industry. And we felt a bit intimidated. We felt like we should maybe bring a third person along also uh, for the reason to have a bit more diverse setup. And we did ask one of our mentors, hey, who could that third person be? What could the characteristics be? How can we diversify our team? And our mentor said, just about anyone, but please don't bring a scientist. <laughs> And that refers a bit to, let's call it the scientist stereotype. That refers to being too much of a scientist, getting too specific too quick, and therefore maybe not being understood by the other side, maybe not being relevant for what they might be interested in. This might be how you communicate, but at the very least, that might be how you are stereotyped by the other side. So even if you are a very versatile communicator, the other side might still see the doctor or the P before or the PhD after your name and think, oh, God, this is going to be a very tough, tough one to understand. So you can make a choice and you can practice that yourself to get to the point 
uh, more concisely and speak differently. And when you want to enter the political sphere, then that kind of communication um, is going to be absolutely crucial. Now, um, I like particularly at the beginning of things to put things on their head. Um, and why would I actually do that? I mean, I will, for example, tell you the framing. I will also introduce myself um, and I will uh, tell you the overview of what we're going to do. But it's going to come a little later. I usually start to like to start with something like a topical appetizer with throwing you in the cold water straight away. Shocking you even in the worst case. <laughs> now, the reason for that is I'd like to use the primacy effect. And that is in the beginning of something, people are more attentive than at the end. And that's why you can grab their attention. And ideally, if the framing allows it, if the setting allows it, should not waste the very beginning with generalities. So start and end relevant um, and not so much with generalities. That as a first thing about science communication per se, or anytime you do communicate with people whose attention you do want to grab. Of course, you do going to get the framing. Of course, all of that does come and it comes now. Uh, we're going to discuss that we've already done, the PhD stereotype. Um, then we're going to look a bit into what are the problems of doing what we see behind me, of extracting peat and destroying whole landscape to extract a fossil material. Knowing that you are mostly uh, scientists yourself, I don't go into great detail with that one, but I would like to go into the political sphere. How did the condom actually happen? And in which setting, in which framing does which argument catch on how to actually work between different political camps and that sort of uh, things. And there's one important remark I would like to make about networking, of course, we usually don't do what we do uh, as a full-time job. Um, a few of us are blessed with that, <laughs> but not everyone. And then we have to make do with a very little bit of time. So we have to be quite deliberate about how we uh, spend our time networking. And finishing the framing, um, please do put your questions into the chat, uh, either in YouTube or in Zoom. And Marion and Leo are uh, nice enough to moderate that. You can also unmute yourself and speak up if it's appropriate but you can also put it in the chat and then Marion can make a call whether to interrupt me or not. That is, of course, totally fine. All right, so what's the problem with extracting peat? Natural peat box are a friend of us, one of the few really, really good friends we do have in our fight for the climate. Natural peat box are carbon sinks. That means um, they do take CO2 out of the atmosphere and in contrast to almost all other uh, biological systems, they do build up the carbon layers. So if a tree dies, it will turn into CO2 within a few years. A peat bark doesn't. So it builds up layers of CO2, uh, layers of carbon. And overall, the peat box are storing twice as much carbon as all the world's forests combined. Um, per square meter, the difference is a factor of 20. So digging that one out is an absolute misery if you think about the climate. Nowadays, if I take it on a global scale, uh, the emissions coming from peat box amount to 5% of the global total emissions. And that is, of course, lamentable thinking it could be our friend, it could be a carbon sink. <laughs> and where does these 5% come from? I mean, 5% for people who are involved in, in climate discussions, it's huge. <laughs> but just to put it into perspective, Globally, aviation, so flying by airplane, transporting cargo by airplane, is less than that. So it is a huge, huge uh, contributor to uh, climate change. Now, that comes from climate change itself. So, for example, thawing permafrost in Siberia is greatly contributing. Um, that leads to peat fires, which might go on for months or even years, of course, emitting megatons of CO2. Also, that happens in Indonesia. And that is also a direct um, correlation with how we do agriculture. So if we drain peat box, which we also do in the Netherlands, that contributes to 4% of our national uh, emissions, then that, of course, also emits CO2, because as soon as I take the water away from a peat box, it starts to oxidize like any other biological system. And lastly, it's peat extraction. 
And in the European Union, a bit more than half goes into energy. Scandinavia, although they're normally very clean, is uh, still treating, or Sweden at least, is still treating peat as a renewable source. So they burn it with, uh, with green subsidies, which is a bizarre uh, thing to happen. And a bit less than half of the peat extracted in the European Union is going into horticulture. In the Netherlands, being a huge horticultural producer, um, both on producing substrates and, also, of course, also using those substrates in our greenhouses and other applications, here it is. A, uh, a We are the biggest importer of peat, and it contributes almost half a percent to our greenhouse gas emissions. Again, might not sound too much, but it is more than the emissions of 50,000 Dutch people uh, with all their activities from eating, living, transport. Now, um, greenhouse gas emissions are by far not the only problem that peat extraction brings with it. And this is why half a percent might not sound like much, but taking the other effects into consideration, it gets really, really miserable. Um, and I think that any economic incentive to drain peat should be removed as soon as possible. It's land subsidence. I mean, in the Netherlands, all these orange shaded areas are below sea level. <laughs> now, Nicole is there from NEOS uh, working with sea levels and knowing that our ground, a large part of the Netherlands, is actually subsiding by one or two centimeters per year makes for a dramatic scenario. And we have really dug our own wet grave in that. Uh, and it continues to get worse with our farming practices. We might damage biodiversity, of course, peat box being a habitat for rare species, both plant and animal. And lastly, one and a half years ago, we've seen floodings in Western Germany, in Belgium, also in Limburg. And this could have been prevented. Ironically, the rivers flew through areas which used to be peat box and which could have been a uh, sponge for taking up excess water. But also in dry spells, in times of draft, the peat box can give off clean water to the surrounding areas, thereby mitigating the, uh, temp the, the variations in water supply, which of course by themselves are increasing due to climate change. Now, that was a problem we wanted to face. Karen and me, Karen is also there with us today. And it actually doesn't correlate with our background. So you can uh, absolutely work on topics that you haven't studied. So we do run a company, Natural Science Careers, where we are giving workshops for scientists. And we, from our training, are live scientists. And the group of workshops that come into play today, um, the topics that give us a, well, let's say, a core qualification is science communication. But we didn't have really much to do with the topic of peat. Basically, um, the only... The starting point two years ago when I got to know Marion, uh, we basically just knew don't buy peat, which the drummer of my high school heavy metal bands told me. <laughs> he went on to study soil science, and that's what he told me. And if, for 20 years, I didn't buy peat, being a good boy. But it was also not a problem because I never really had a garden. <laughs> so buying this one bag of ground, which I bought per year, uh, doing that peat free was never a hassle. Moving to the Netherlands, all of a sudden we did have a garden and we were facing empty shelves. I mean, the shelves were filled, but they were filled with peat. But if you were looking for peat-free substrates, it was virtually impossible. In one case, I had to cycle nine case with my cargo bike to buy a couple of bags of uh, peat-free potting ground. Now, it was really strange. We looked into that topic a little bit. Our scientific curiosity got triggered and we thought, what is behind that? And we did see that there was no press coverage about that topic at all since 2014. So it was really a non-topic in the Netherlands. And that, despite the Netherlands being the second biggest importer of peat in the world, second only to the US, the huge horticultural market, well, how, why does no one talk about what material they are actually, actually using? And it got even weirder when we saw Wageningen, but also other universities, Nijmegen, uh, Utrecht, and others doing research into peat alternatives. But no one speaking about it in TV, radio, newspapers, nothing. Just, of course, the journals and the, the trade journals. 
Now we thought, okay, maybe that's our moment. Maybe science communication is the missing piece in that puzzle and maybe we can provide that. We did ask people, and this is something I'm gonna get back to in the last topic of network. And we did do expert interviews and we asked people, which direction shall we take? Top down or bottom up? Shall we influence politicians and try to trigger regulation, which will then triple, trickle down into the population and change people's behavior? Or should we go bottom up um, and basically create a grassroots movement, create a lot of customers who are asking for a non-existing product and get things going that way? And in these expert interviews, we actually got conflicting information. It was very interesting because both sides of the story were actually true. So um, we did hear you have to go bottom up. Why would a politician react to something which doesn't exist in terms of public interest? Why would they put something onto people's uh, behavior, onto the market, where no one really shows them that they're interested in it? Of course, they represent voters. And if no one is interested in that, it would be an uphill battle for them to fight for regulation in that direction. But we also heard that uh, it only will work top down. You have to forbid products which are highly damaging because there is only a very small proportion of the population. Behavioral psychologists estimate three to 5% of the people who would do the right thing against their purse, against their wallet, and for example, buy a more expensive product just because they know that's the more sustainable one. So therefore, a grassroots movement is by definition very, very slow. Um, now, both have turned out to be right. Um, it did start with an article by Karen. We're going to see how that worked out, how we cracked the, how, how we squared the circle with top down versus bottom up in a moment. Now, Karen did write an article. Um, actually, it was just a laser brief, just a letter to the editor to start with. And um, if we translate it to English, you're going to see that has very um, confrontative language, very direct, very loud language, if you wish. Potting soil is a bag full of preventable misery. And it doesn't get any better uh, for the industry. <laughs> when we look at the subtitle, I'm reading that out. We're getting annoyed about the rainforest being destroyed, but don't have an eye for the destruction happening in the peat box in our backyard. So we do have... Uh, a non-debate, and that is the context of uh, why and how Karen wrote that article. As a non-debate, no one is speaking about that topic, and therefore loud activating rhetorics have been chosen. If you look into that, Greta Thunberg certainly has an impact, and she is also a pretty loud person. I mean, going to the end and saying, how dare you, is relatively loud. <laughs> but I also do think that apart from being loud when activation is needed, um, she also changed the narrative. Think back of Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth. That movie was full of abstract technical information. He tried to argue with rising curves to activate people, but well, <laughs> people apparently didn't really care. The movie was being watched by millions, but didn't make any difference. Now, if I may put these words into Greta Thunberg's mouth, if I would summarize what she's done, it would be, it's generational stupid. This is a completely different uh, way of looking at things. And for me personally, as a father, this has tremendous impact. If I think about the case that my kids will come to me at some point and say, so what did you do? And I would come up with saying, oh, I occasionally didn't eat meat. Then they would just tell me, that you've really failed us. <laughs> and that is a narrative that Greta Thunberg brought into play and which really accelerated the whole debate. Now, um, you as a scientist, can you actually also be loud? And it is very convenient for people that for the, the people who would like to keep the status quo, who would like climate action to be a really lame affair, they would like us to keep quiet. Of course, we scientists shouldn't, shouldn't behave like anyone else. We should not lose our scientific objectivity and thereby our credibility. But you as a scientist, of course, appear as a scientist, but you also appear in other roles, for example, as a private person. So why shouldn't you speak differently when you're invited on a dinner table? Also, um, 
why not say an opinion if you state that it's an opinion? For example, you do have the primary data, which should, of course, be peer-reviewed, well-proven, but you also have interpretation of that. And anything on the political sphere is always interpretation because it is something in the future. We are saying we are changing the rule book in order to effect change. And by definition, we can't know how it plays out. We can only say this is the most likely route to success. Or we can, and I think we also should speak up when something squarely contradicts scientific consensus. Now, um, the train rolled on just a few weeks later. Luckily, we got delayed by the shell zag. <laughs> and then also by a nice motion from the Partei for the Dieren, but with a couple of weeks delay, just a month after the uh, after the first article, Karen was invited at Fruge Vogels, a very popular um, radio show. And um, that was being picked up by politics. So there were two Kamerfragen. So this is a parliamentary inquiry by a CDA, by a conservative party, and by Partei for the Dieren, a progressive Green Party. And lastly, also a parliamentary motion. And by that time, we've already been in contact with the uh, parliamentarian Dirk Boswijk, and half that motion has actually been written by us. <laughs> so um, that motion triggered the so-called convenant process, and it was supposed to take one year. Um, due to two changes on the top of the agricultural ministry, it took 16 months in total, but I think in total still a reasonably fast and smooth process. But when looking into the Convenant, we first of all need to understand what it actually is and maybe uh, go, go on that explore, exploration trip with my eyes. Uh, we are pretty international as I do see it, so some of you might be Dutch, but see it from my foreign eyes of how that Convenant process looks like. <laughs> so we have to see the background is that uh, the Dutch politics is liberal. The two biggest parties, one center left, one center right, are both liberal parties, Days and Sestig and Fevi Day. And um, liberal politics means that politics likes to let the private sector do their thing until things go bad. And when things go bad, unluckily very often they still don't do much, but <laughs> when things go really bad, only then does politics really get active. So it's a bit of a hands-off political system. And from that mindset, from the political tradition, the Convenant process is being born. So the Convenant itself is a discussion which leads to a contract, and that contract is, um, the discussions around that are moderated by people from industry, but also from people from the industry state officials. And the whole thing came from the, uh, the public. So it has been triggered and finally also supported by us as an NGO. And um, two ministers are sponsoring that process in the background, ideally, we hope, <laughs> also with cash for innovation, with money for our work, for example, as well, and for some expenses that the industry has in, in implementing that. So it's a broadly supported uh, thing. And it really, there is not the top-down minist ministerial approach which says this has to happen, but it really comes from the industry itself. And that has to be seen the chances for success. If it comes from industry itself, that's your goals, guys, and you don't live up to that. They don't want to hear that. So they really try to make that happen. It has been shown in the past, not always, but quite often these convenants, although they're quite open and usually don't come with uh, a potential a threat for punishment if things are not being fulfilled, they usually are being fulfilled and um, lived. Now, a few details about the Convenant itself. It's relatively detailed, but at the same time open. So it's a 24 page document, but in some ways it does leave it open how it's gonna be filled up in the future. So for 2025, we do have um, precise targets for both the professional and the um, private sector. The private market is a bit stricter because here, technically speaking, it's a lot easier to replace peat. So already in two years from now, we're gonna see peat being the minor component uh, in our growth substrates. And in the professional market, that's not gonna be the case yet, but we are approaching 50-50 at least. For 2030, uh, the 
targets for the professional market will be determined by further research which will be conducted uh, which is currently being conducted and the private sector is going to be largely peat free um, you see here that um, the attribute the um, thing that's been defined in the convenant is percentage renewables and the non-renewables are peat plus a few other non-renewables -renew uh, like sand, which are not problematic, but it's been defined that way. Um, but I've given the percentages as the rough percentages of peat that this would correspond to in brackets. For 2050, we have one of these um, open formulations. It should be environmentally neutral, and that should be determined based on a life cycle analysis, which will be conducted and will be finalized this year. Now. Um, great if they're not only uh, carbon neutral but environmentally neutral but that being based on an LCA which has not worked out yet of course leaves the door open it can go both ways 90% renewables means that in 2050 no matter what the LCA says the world of Dutch horticulture and Dutch uh, private gardens will be an almost peat-free one and what we also do have is transparency so uh, ingredients lists on products both online and offline and this is absolutely not the case now buy a bag of potting ground online you're not going to see what's in there and also um, industry will have to report figures annually and that will be checked by a notary or someone from the ministry and this is as far as I know I've asked a few researchers from around the globe um, as far as I know this is the first in the world that the substrate industry has to report annual figures so what did we actually do for that comment on process? Our influence has been primarily on the level of transparency. The other figures um, industry came up with, we don't know how much our influence weighed in um, influencing what they wrote up for 2030 and 2050. We did not influence the 25 targets that came from industry in state like that uh, throughout the entire process. So we can just trust and hope that the level of ambition is adequate to the uh, situation. Now, does it mean that the Netherlands is a laggard or a front runner? Uh, if we take the international view on that, we do certainly have Switzerland as the front runner. Switzerland, they 30 years ago passed a law that would protect their own peat box. And then a smart person came up and said, Oh, wait a second. If you protect our peat box, isn't it terribly inconsistent if we then dig out someone else's peat box? <laughs> oh, yeah, we could actually. So they are very consequent and they want to go for a peat ban. So there's going to be a tiny percentage uh, peat left in their substrates. But for the rest, they want to ban it for both the professional and the private market. We do have a range of countries, Germany, Ireland, England and Norway, uh, where very ambitious targets have been um, promoted but basically by a almost pure top-down approach so it is questionable whether the buy-in from industry uh whether the buy-in whether there's actually even enough in interest from the customers and also the accountability who's measuring uh the industry figures that is all questionable in germany for example the minister made this big and bold statement saying yes we're going to be out of the peat uh, in 26 for the private market, market and almost peat free in the, in the professional sector by 2030. And it has to be voluntary, which means that industry came and said, oh, thank you very much for that. We bring our own targets, which of course were a lot less ambitious. So no one knows what's going to happen there. In the Netherlands, we do have targets which sound less ambitious than, for example, those in England or uh, the other countries that I've just mentioned might be um, a more realistic balance, but the advantage of the Dutch um, continent is certainly the broad support. And a very similar thing has happened uh, almost in parallel in Belgium. The targets are less ambitious than in the Netherlands, but still the broad support from a range of industry uh, bodies is certainly a plus of the Belgian plan. Now, this is a printout from the continent because I've had discussions with Karen. Shall we now actually sign this thing or not? And you do see, um, I mean, the document is now publicly available, but I don't want to go into that detail. But basically, you do see there were a lot of things that are marked green, which I liked, and a lot of things that are marked red, which I didn't like. And that goes to all the pages. Now, um, 
basically should we sign it or not and the first question going into that decision is certainly with how much of that document do you agree it is a compromise so it won't ever be 100 percent no one who signed that document there were 15 parties in total no one has full agreement with that document for sure now if it would be too lousy though it would be kind of dishonest and probably not quite fruitful if we would sign it but that question didn't really answer the question whether we should sign it or not because we were really undecided but then the question which solved it for us was where do you actually have more influence so as a convenant party we're actually going to be in the inner circle we're going to be part of the steering committee uh everything has to be disclosed to us we are attending all the uh important meetings for eight years until 2030 great <laughs> um so this is why we think this is a pragmatic step to sign a document where you agree with the majority of things but of course by far not everything now um we did keep publicity high before and after the covenant the train is rolling on um with a variety of things even our chicken got that 10 minutes of fame, as you see on the bottom here in the Trau article. And even in the hairdresser saloons, you can read about Türfrei uh, in the Libelle. <laughs> now, um, that, of course, creates a backdrop of, hey, we have more publicity than the entire horticultural sector. <laughs> if you look into the general press, great. So that, of course, gives us weight in these discussions. Now, as part of the Convenant, we are communicating in a different way if things go wrong we are as sharp and as confrontative if if required as ever so there's one paragraph in the convenant which is scientifically unsound so during my five minute speech during the signing um ceremony i was speaking that out very directly and saying this is scientifically nonsense sorry guys uh how does that come in here but for the majority of our communication, we now would like to go into a different stage, into a stage of differentiation, into a stage of looking beyond the, the just, hey, Pete is bad, guys, because that message has already been come, uh, brought across. We got to continue to say, hey, don't use Pete if somehow possible, but we want to look into other things as well. Um, so in our role, I'll give you one example from a LinkedIn post that we've done a couple of months ago. It was about um, cut flowers and cut flowers might be known to all of you have a terrible uh, ecological footprint. So, um, but basically we don't just want to bash things. We want to differentiate. And so the text of that was reading buying cut flowers is a nice natural gift or environmental burden. The answer is it depends. And although most cut flowers, if you see it in a random supermarket, don't buy them <laughs> they really are terrible but there is a differentiation here milieu central has a flower calendar where you can look up what is actually in season what has a realistic chance to be produced under somewhat responsible conditions so um this comes with our new role um that we want to look at it like that now let's see the parliamentarian who handed in that motion why did he do that? And it's interesting to take his perspective. Because strangely enough, um, he comes from a conservative party. And it's a conservative party with a big industrial farm lobby. So these guys who are protesting against the nitrogen regulation, they are basically the base voters for CDR. And this is, of course, a voter group that the CDR doesn't want to lose. Now, in the last national election, CDR did lose a lot of support. Um, and Dirk Boswijk himself is a first-time parliamentarian. So we do have the situation that um, there is a party and a parliamentarian who really want to get a green profile, but without hurting the farm lobby. In the last few years, I mean, Switzerland and England are the front runners um, when it comes to reducing peat. But other countries have actually jumped on that track. Um, and you can, within this relatively small niche that uh, Pete as a substrate has, it is kind of a fashion topic because a lot of people, uh, countries are starting to pick that up. 
in a general sense, um, your project needs to fit the story, it needs to fit the political setting in order to um, to get that momentum that you need in order to enact change. And very often, impact happens between bubbles. And that is very important. We did ask, I mean, we can't tell who should sign that motion. We were happy that anyone did that. But we did ask one of our mentors, hey, um, so there were, in total, there are two parliamentarians who were handing in that motion. This is Boswijk from the CDA, from the Conservative Party. And there's Laura Bromet from GroenLinks, the Dutch Green Party. Would it be more intelligent if the Conservative or the Green politician would hand that in? And we got the very clear answer, let the centre-right hand that in. Because you're going to get a lot more support, except for the right-wing extremists. All the other parliamentarians were supporting the PEEP motion, 80% support. Because centre-right is, of course, supporting what Dirk Boswijk is bringing up because it's one of their people. And the left is supporting it because of the content. So this is a very generalizable pattern. For example, in Germany, that the military draft was abolished, a typically left, left topic was handed in. Finally, after years and years that everybody was saying, come on, this is just too crazy to have a 10-month draft and have a few drunk uh, high school students you can't send them to war. So let's just abolish this nonsense. But it can't come from the left. <laughs> so it had to be, be done by the conservative parties and the other way around as well. And this is something you need to take into account. This, of course, by itself means that the interesting things do happen um, between the bubbles. So you need to speak with people outside of your own environment, outside of people with your own worldview, if you want to make some real impact. Now, was what we've done top down or bottom up? In a way, both. <laughs> so we did target our main aim was to go to the political sphere and influence that as directly as possible. But at the same time, the publicity that we managed to strike up made it sound as if there was a lot of bottom up uh, interest in that topic, although, frankly speaking, it wasn't. <laughs> so it was a bit of a hybrid approach. And yeah. Doesn't matter for me why, but it did work. Um, so in a way, both the people we interviewed for the expert interviews were right. Now, as the last topic of today, um, I'd like to look into networking and um, recruit help. That is very important. Um, don't go it alone. Although Karen and me might sometimes seem like loners doing things a bit very independently and having our own ideas about things, but still, you need to recruit help. Um, and I say recruit help. Be proactive about it and ask people for help. Don't just wait for that to happen. Of course, sometimes uh, you stumble across the Scientist for Future community, for example, and then you, you meet Marian and everything's super supportive and everybody's helping you. But sometimes you need to actually ask for it. And we had the big luck. Alexander de Roo, one of the co-founders of the Dutch Green Party, is living in our street. Yay! <laughs> And he's a fantastic politician and a very, very helpful um, person who's now sort of doing his, his passion projects on the local scale. So he also does have a bit of time and he's been very, very helpful for us. Um, that's a lucky case. But the interesting thing is, having someone like that at back, backhand means influencing politics is a bit like paint by the numbers. Yeah. Oh, Alexander, how can we do that? This is what we want to achieve. Yeah, you need a parliamentary motion. Uh, how do we get a motion? You need a radio show or something, publicity of a similar scale. Okay, cool. Do you maybe have some contacts we can contact? Yes, you have some. Can I drop your name? Yes, you can. Great. Done. Um, the interesting thing is, though, we have reached out promiscuously to people. And when we ask for, let's call that an expert interview, when we ask, hey, do you have 10 minutes of your time to speak with us? Um, we need a piece of information from you then very consistently, we have gotten positive replies. And I'm doing the same for my, for the company I'm running with, Karen. Um, I'm doing dozens and dozens of expert interviews every year. Why do people so consistently help you with that? I'd love to say people are inherently good because then a lot of problems would solve itself. And partly that's also true. Um, pe people are not inherently bad, but we need to look into their self-interest of why they're doing it. First of all, 
that makes us more assertive in asking for those expert interviews. And second of all, it also allows us to do it better when I reach out to people that I do it in a way that it's more likely that they're going to agree and say yes. So the first reason why people are agreeing to give an expert interview or a similar format is because they like talking about themselves. So if you frame it as an expert interview saying, hey, you know something that I don't, it's quite likely that they're going to feel, feel nice, feel respected. Then they're going to work on their own network. I mean, there is a gap of knowledge for you, but of course you are not nothing. You're a scientist and you are with their information and with what are you doing in whatever advocacy or anything else you're doing, you are of course growing. So the relationship between you and them have, has started by them giving you a favor. So when they want to reach out to you, it's a lot easier for them to do so. So even purely egoistically, it makes sense to give that bit of time. But it is very important to show them that it will be a bit of time, that you are well prepared, that you've got the puzzle laid out, that there's this one piece missing and that they can uh, provide it for you. So be brief in your, for example, contact email and show them that you've already done some homework and that there's only that one piece missing. It's not going to take forever for them. And lastly, it's a generation contract. Very often people feel like I've been helped at some point. I'm happy to pay back. So um, this feeling of, of roundness, this feeling of this is just, this is fair, of course, motivates people to pay back if the approach is appropriate. But how do we do it? Um, first of all, very important, if we do look at a networking scale from you are a complete unknown person on the very left to you are part of their family on the very right, you don't need to be very, very far on that spectrum. I dare say somewhere on that is, of course, very uh, just a simple visualization. If you are non-zero, you're in the game for asking for something like an expert interview. Uh, because it makes a tremendous difference if you are just copy-pasting an email uh, and that is it, without any personalization, then you are perceived as an email, nothing else. But if you move away and if you move into that red circle, all of a sudden you're a person and you are treated like one. And in order to get there, name dropping my dear Alexander de Rowe, for example, is easily enough to bring you probably even past that red circle. Now, how can you reach out? And that pitch email that you write um, does, of course, have a few elements that are recurring and that are actually quite easy to reproduce. So the subject line. You want to have the thing that makes it most likely for people to read your email right into the subject email and need a good signal to noise ratio. So you need to have just that piece of information, nothing else. So my subject lines are usually, for example, if it is a contact via, which I got via Alexander, then I am just saying contact via Alexander Dero, nothing else. Because why I'm actually contacting them comes a bit later. Um, that's going to be my first sentence. I do bring that person into CC if appropriate. So maybe that person wants to have control. Maybe I'm allowed to CC them in. Um, then it's also, of course, nice to bring some extra personal touch into the email. But of course, be aware that you don't want to spam their inbox uh, by seeing them in too much. Then you do address them. Everybody has a name and people do like hearing their name. Now that sounds very trivial, but please, I wouldn't say it if I wouldn't have seen too many examples which omit that. So give it a personal touch by, by appropriately addressing people. Dean, st start with why. Um, I'm reaching to you out to you because you don't build that up step by step until after a whole paragraph, you finally come up with why you're contacting them. Use that as the very first sentence. This is what I want from you. Then you have to give a work sample. You have to give a work sample that it's going to be easy work for them to speak with you, that you're not going to chew off their ear. So you show your prior work. I've already got the whole puzzle piece, puzzle ready. There's one piece missing. Okay. Um, and then you finish off by a concrete call to action. And again, that sounds trivial, but 
do tell them, I would like to ask for 10 minutes of your time in order to discuss these questions. Do write that. Don't assume the other side knows what you want, because quite often that doesn't happen by itself. Okay, so that is for me my personal absolute favorite activity for networking. I am gonna, I am doing it all the time, and I'm going to continue doing that at least until retirement, probably thereafter as well, because it's just a lot of fun. And there's no excuse not to do it. It's fully uh, distance proof, Corona proof and introvert proof because it is a well-prepared, uh, well-prepared, relatively deep one-on-one uh, -on -one interaction. So it's not superficial at all. All right. Um, as a last note before uh, wrapping up, I'd like to... I'd like to let you know a few thoughts about the scope of activities, which is very important not to feel overwhelmed with what you're doing. So um, if you do take to the TURF project as an example, then how do we define the scope of that in order to get stuff done? And the secret sauce to that, in my view, is to, say, to be able to say no. So if there's something which is very uh peripheral for your activities if you really enjoy doing that of course i'm also doing things where i know nothing's going to come out of that one but it's just really nice people or i really enjoy that setting yes i'm doing that i've been at a high school recently it was absolutely wonderful to be there it was a, a super big challenge as a science communicator but of course i know that this as such does not make the world of a difference but for the core of our activities we need to be very focused so we are two people primarily um, who are doing that next to family and job obligations, of course. And um, we are adding into that one a network of mutual support with various people and uh, organizations. Still, the amount of stuff that we can get done, although we have, of course, that network of help, is limited. So if I would try to abbreviate what we're doing into a single sentence, it would be political lobbyism, Publicity work is kind of a passion project for us, but it's also a flanking activity, which of course catalyzes that political lobbyism. But basically that conversation with Dirk Boswijk before three days before the motion, that was what we worked towards. Um, and we do that on the product level of peat. So we're not doing it on the water levels in the wetlands. Uh, this is an agricultural question. We're doing it on, you are importing a product. How is that product being marketed and labeled? So within that story, I showed you that the problem with the peat, we have 5% global emissions. We are condensing on this bite-sized subtopic, and we are, for now at least, sticking with that. But we might not stick with that forever because um, we like to do new things. And um, for now, we do know there's two things which we're going to do anyway, uh, and which are basically set for the next few years. Being part of the Commandant Steering Committee, absolutely, we are going to take that responsibility um, to the best of our abilities. And in a couple of weeks, we have the first meeting. Um, so we can continue to be constructive yet critical. <laughs> and um, we've made the link to our paid work. So I've recently launched an impact workshop where it is about scientists trying to influence the political sphere. Um, and that, with a tiny bit of marketing, has already made it to become the best-selling uh, workshop for uh, for that year. So great. Um, I'm getting paid for my passion project. Excellent. So percent by percent, I'm increasing the proportion of my activities, which actually have some relation to climate or related topics. And an outreach workshop is going to follow later on this year. Um, but there's a few things, and I'd love to hear your, your input for that. So please uh, write your thoughts in the chat or raise your hand or uh, raise a, a point in the chat if you want to have thoughts about that. Whether you say, hey, this could be of great impact or watch out, there's a stumbling block here or that's not going to work anyway because. Four ideas that we are spinning around a bit at the moment. One of them could be that we branch out into related industries. So what has worked for the peat industry could also work for something like cut flowers, ornamental plants, get people aware that quite a lot of activities around that look like green because you have a flower in your hand, but they're ultimately consumerist. We could go international, and this is already happening. 
but it's a super complex topic to try to influence uh, the European institutions. To do that really as a focused main activity, that's a lot of impact that's potentially to be held, but this is also a super, super complex one. And yeah, absolutely, the peat lobby is already in Brussels. They have their headquarters there, and we need to, of course, tackle that. As a two-person show, that's going to be a challenge. We might also go legal, rights of nature legislation, for example, trying to get peatlands assigned as with their own legal entity, thereby giving them much more protective rights. That could be a beautiful one. But of course, the legal side of that would be way beyond our competence. We are not lawyers at all, but yeah, we are also not soil scientists and it also has also worked. So why not uh, promote that? Um, we're gonna see, maybe. And we could also broaden the achievement that we brought into the Covenant has been the transparency, has been the labeling. And why should that not be rolled out? I mean, Oatly, for example, is a uh, is leading in labeling their products with their carbon footprint. Why shouldn't there be legislation which forces every country and every product to name their carbon footprint? And it would have huge impact. I also sometimes stand in the supermarket and I think, yes, I want to buy the more sustainable product. And I've studied chemistry and uh, I don't know which one it is. <laughs> So that would be also be maybe a direction that I could take, or that we could take. So any thoughts on that, also feel free to write me an email. Would be very, very warmly welcome. Now, um, feel free to stay in touch with us. Um, Marion's gonna put a link to the slides into the chats, but you can also take that uh, tiny URL on the right. You can stay in touch with us in LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, or of course, at any point, write us an email and you find more information on our homepage at turffrei.nl. Now I'm gonna finish off with the take homes for today. And that is, first of all, be aware of the PhD stereotype. Um, that might be how we communicate, but at the least that might be how you're being perceived. So be aware of how people do see you and that they might be like, oh God, a doctor. <laughs> and might be a bit turned off as speaking to you in the first place. Then a debate goes through various phases. So I think it is totally fine to adapt your communication. Do you need to activate and be loud? Or is pure information transfer what is needed for that? Quite often it is not. People do know it. They just neglect uh, the information that is out there. Do you need to differentiate your message? Do you maybe also need to connect people with each other from various camps? Then when looking to the political sphere, look at the motivations uh, of the various players, look at how the stories, I mean, politics is also about stories, how they evolve in order to try to influence the right things at the right time. And lastly, do collect help and expertise from people with expert interviews and grow your network that way. All right, um, that was the talk. Thank you very much from my side, and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. I see that the chat is filling up, but I haven't tried to read and speak at the same time, which doesn't really work, but uh, Marion's going to help me with that one. All right. Yes, I think Karen has already answered uh, one question that was posted in the chat, whether uh, you're training people uh, to communicate on their activist issues is not going to backfire if you're also in, um, in a covenant and talking with politicians. Uh, so Karen has already answered that, uh, that you've been giving workshops for years and she doesn't think it'd be an issue. <laughs> but maybe you want to add something. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I have just, I mean, maybe Karen can find the, the link online. Um, I have given, I have just developed a workshop around basically the topics that we discussed today, expanding into argumentation strategies, adapting your communication. Um, so absolutely, this is my job since 10 years. And absolutely, I'm very happy with anyone who would like to get in touch uh, for, for that. Yeah. And of course, if it is a idealist outfit, for example, um, I've done something like this in Nijmegen at the university. If this is coming from an idealist uh, direction, then of course, then uh, money is never going to be an issue. Let's put it that way. Nicole. Hi, thank you for the talk. It was really interesting. 
I had a question all the way through in my head, but then you, you answered it slightly near the end. But I was wondering if you could maybe expand on it slightly, which was I was thinking if if you hadn't have focused on the peat subject and you'd found another subject, can you were that was there ever a point that another subject came up over the last couple of years and you thought, wow, I could have also applied the same level of energy to this subject? Is it mm -hmm. cut flowers or are there, are there more subjects that you come up? And really, I'm asking, maybe you could suggest to the audience other subjects that people could throw themselves behind or particular issues. Yeah, quite often. I mean, it is this five years ago, we sat together and we thought, yeah, somehow communicating about, about climate, but it's not our subject. We just find it super relevant. But then just to say, oh, we didn't really have the starting point for that. So we were really looking for how can we do that? and then bring that into the workshop sphere so that we have a multiplier effect that all the seminar participants would have to then also speak with people um, in some way. The peat issue was certainly the thing where we say we now have something, the case study that we can use as a starting point, but there are of course many, many issues where we have to say no to because there are just so many interesting ones. I personally think cut flowers, for example, is a wonderful topic um, to engage with because it is just, a very obvious one and the damage no matter if it's grown in the full ground in netherlands then you have the pesticides liters and liters of pesticide on these plants if it's grown in a greenhouse it's incredibly carbon intense um, in a heated greenhouse and if it's flown in from africa and half of it is being thrown away because the sales window is so small the carbon footprint is obviously also very high and people are not aware of it they're just like hey darling Sorry, I cheated on you. Here, have some flowers. <laughs> I mean, this is such a silly tradition. Um, cut flowers is a wonderful one, absolutely. Ornamental plants, they take up uh, about half the peat that's used in the Netherlands. But many ornamental plants, if they're grown out of season, are also just a throwaway product, a consumer's product, yes. And so I personally think these are uh, ripe for some public attention, let's say. Absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, Karen, if you do come up with something, feel free to write in the chat or say it. Oh, yeah, I actually do. <laughs> because I think, uh, yeah, if we think in terms of like what is interesting for customers, then that, that but we have like also another opinion piece in the pipeline of which we know is going to be published. And it's a completely different topic in this case. It's actually about uh, universities not adapting to climate change themselves. Uh, uh, and here as well, we are really aware that once it is published, that it might lead to a political discussion. So I think that is, uh, so yes, I think that would be a topic we would be equally passionate about to pursue, like how can academia or how can universities actually live a more sustainable life themselves? Like things like why are, is meat still being served? Why are we encouraged to fly to conferences instead of taking the train? Uh, so all these sort of issues that uh, university is not dealing with. Uh, so yes, I think this could be definitely uh, as well a topic, as well as cut flowers, where we would be so passionate about it, we would be happy to stay awake until 11 or midnight uh, to get that done. This is also something which, um, yeah, universities have a multiplier effect. They install install norms in people and this is something every most people who are engaged with scientists for future have some university affiliation so people can really lobby on their doorstep and make an impact not only on that solar panel on that building let's say but on how people receive how an organization should be run yeah. thanks for that okay. i saw a question from leo um, and I also have to look at the time because it is nine o'clock now, so we, we need to kind of um, wrap up. But maybe uh, you can answer Leo's question whether the covenant is signed by the complete industry or are there players that have been left out that did not want to sign? Yeah, I mean, we do have, there were lobby groups. So they are basically the organization which is representing the uh, all the substrate industries. And the same also for various other reasons, for example, for the champignon industry, but basically has everybody who uses some peat been uh, signing that? No, not. Um, I don't know the exact proportion, but it will probably go in the 90 plus percent of peat being used. Yes. Then I saw a question by Durte uh, about the backfiring again. Um, she's worried that if politicians like Boswijk realize that you are also uh, giving workshops, 
and that they were specifically approached as a targeted approach. You know, you let him do the um, uh, motion uh, because he will say the yeah, that he might feel a bit used, that we might have to be a little bit careful with sharing this knowledge. <laughs> Mm. No, it is think? basically, um, it could theoretically be, absolutely. Um, the thing is, of course, there is one and a half years in between the motion and the launch of that workshop. And it is just, I mean, it has been probably more or less on the same level of activity as my normal job. And of course, if I personally grow, if I learn something, this is just all our workshops are being based on a mixture of things that we've experienced, that we've done somewhere Um I think, I mean, it, it would be the same as saying, hey, if I write a book about that, um, why not? I mean, authors are also taking their experience from somewhere. My output is not books, but is a workshop. So I personally don't see a problem with that. And Boswag is working on the political sphere. I'm now doing the detail work on the Convenant. So he's probably quite happy that his motion is not only successful, but it's also put into action. I, this is really a... a um, I think we... Yeah. Maybe you should also, you could also, I mean, politicians are on the day-to-day -day de uh, basis dealing with this. Yeah, they are like, there are people lobbying for it all the time. And maybe it's also nice to add, actually, we contacted Boswijk ourselves, but he came back within a minute saying that he was about to email us. And I think this is something to be aware of, that all politicians in the Netherlands seem to be listening to the Vroege Vogels radio station. So if you want to have an impact then you have to sit there on Sunday morning. I think that was the best thing that could have happened to us. Uh, so I think it's not a problem for them at all, so not to be mentioned afterwards. I think they're also proud, actually, that they put something on the table that the majority have agreed with. And that, yeah, so I would, I'm not worried about that at all, that it would backfire, to be honest. And now I've just read the, the exact wording of Dirtis' uh, input. Thank you very much. Yes, seeing from that perspective, um, Politicians are happy for that. I mean, lobbying doesn't necessarily mean that, boom, I'm pushing myself into the uh, Tweede Kamer and um, I'm trying to really draft a law for someone. These politicians were looking for a topic and they did get it from us. Um, so it is a win-win situation in this case. And it's good to see we are lobbyists, but it's not only these bad big organizations. It can also be a very small outfit with chicken in their garden which is uh, lobbying and in, in, enacting political change. So maybe I see two roles tinted, but for me, it's a win-win. <laughs> okay, thank you. I um, see one question from Nicole. Nicole, what's this? Will the Convenant affect the sale of PT Scotch whiskey? Maybe we can end with that question. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe someone has a bottle in their home and uh, it takes it as a transition into their evening program. Um, I don't know exactly about the provisions. I mean, the thing is, it's English and Irish have enacted a peat reduction plan. In Scotland, I'm not aware. I know that something is moving in that direction. In Wales, I haven't read about Scotland yet. Uh, of course, yeah. I mean, peat can always be imported as a product and then burned to make their whiskey. So I guess until whiskey is really in danger, uh, that will take a while, yes. Uh, and whiskey holds for a long time, so you can stack up now. <laughs> I, maybe I should okay. add to that, but I, I only drink peat-free whiskey anyway. There is, it is okay. available. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, yeah, right. I guess this is really a niche product and we're gonna see, but we first of all focus on the big things. There are very competent people lobbying on water levels, trying to work on climate change itself. So all the dangers that peat bogs are facing now, we are working on that niche, but within the niche of extracted peat, of course, whiskey is a much, much smaller one. We are focusing first of all on the bigger ones and this is horticulture. And yeah, we could also branch into uh, peat for combustion. That is of course for energy use. That would also be a nice topic to tackle because it is just so lame. It is even dirtier than brown coal. Anyone who has been in Lützerath or read about that there is an even dirtier fuel, which is subsidized by green subsidies. So also a nice topic to lobby for. <laughs> okay, enough to do. So um, I think I, uh, we should close the, um, the session now. It's past nine o'clock. I want to thank you, uh, Philip and Karen as well in the background for uh, um, uh, bringing us up to date in the process of creating a confident with, confident with industry and uh, with networking. 
And I think we can take these lessons to the topics that we are taking action on, like, for example, no new fossil fuel infrastructure. So thank you very much. And um, yeah, hope to hear from, uh, from you in the future how the confidence working out. So I want to end this uh, session by bringing your attention to the next webinar, which will be on the 7th of February. And that's the start of a new series of um, Science, Scientists for Future webinars called Kennis maken met Klimaatkunde. And it's actually in Dutch. And they are webinars uh, for non-climate scientists by climate scientists. So the first one is by Peter Kuipers Munneke, and he'll be talking about greenhouse gases, and that will be on the 7th of February, and more information will be on our website. And then I want to close this webinar with again thanking Philip, and um, hope to see you again at the next webinar. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much for having me, and thanks for all of you for coming. <laughs>